Elk are emblematic of the remarkable success of wildlife management. There was a time when it looked like we might lose our elk population here in Colorado. In 1910, we had less than a thousand elk in the state. Now we have the largest elk population in the country with over 290,000 individuals. Colorado's landscape is incredibly rich and incredibly diverse. There's a lot of public land, vast mountainsides and hillsides and mountain ranges, and it's largely unchanged. Elk are an incredibly important part of Colorado's landscape. Outdoor recreation is becoming increasingly important just for human quality of life, but then also we're starting to see that that's really playing a very important and influential role in our economy. Colorado Parks and Wildlife is mandated to manage the wildlife populations for the citizens of Colorado kind of in trust. It's important to us that we have these healthy, productive elk populations, but we're also trying to recognize that as a state, Colorado is growing. It's really a great experience when you can walk up a trail, pop up over a ridge or a crest line and see a herd of elk just chilling out or playing or just doing their thing in a way that hopefully is not too different than what it would have been hundreds of years ago. Nobody wants to be the problem for wildlife. It's a balancing point that Parks and Wildlife is challenged with, but I think it's an important challenge because pretty much everybody puts a pretty high value on our wildlife. It's finding that balance point between people living their lives happily and healthy, but also allowing wildlife populations to do the same. Around 2010, we did start seeing some declines in recruitment. When we refer to recruitment, we're talking about the number of elk calves that make it into the adult population. And typically we measure that from zero to approximately one year of age. And then we consider those animals recruited. Every winter, our biologists and game wardens go out and fly and they'll collect ratios of the number of calves to the number of cows. We've started noticing declines in those ratios, starting somewhere in the 60 to 70 calves per 100 cows getting down into the 50s and 40s and even 30s. We've identified a lot of different potential factors. There's been quite a few studies looking at how elk respond to human disturbance on the landscape, and we know that they respond behaviorally. So over the last 10 or 15 years, I'd say that there's been increasing concern among Colorado Parks and Wildlife about the potential impacts that human recreationists on the landscape are having on our ungulate populations. So about a year ago, we set out to evaluate how human recreation may be influencing our elk populations. Every March we go out to capture adult female elk from our study herds and our goal is to put GPS collars and vaginal implant transmitters on 40 adult females who are pregnant. We hire a helicopter crew, which goes out typically with a pilot, a net gunner, and a mugger. And once they find an adult female elk, they'll shoot the net over her from the helicopter, get out and restrain her and put her in a bag, which they then sling her underneath the helicopter back to our processing site nearby. All right, he's gonna bring that in on a long line. We sedate the elk and process it and collect a number of biological data from it. One of the first things we do is we wanna assess whether or not they're pregnant. So we do this using an ultrasound machine. She is indeed pregnant. So there we can see the ribs and actually we can see the spinal column and perhaps even the skull on the neonate. Okay. If they are pregnant, we put a GPS collar on. Ear tag. We'll use a vaginal implant transmitter, a VIT, which sits in the birth canal. That gets pushed out when a calf is born. We're able to use those satellite locations and know exactly when that birthing event happened and then also where it happened. We can then go capture and collar their calf when they give birth. And then we're able to start monitoring calf survival. We collect some basic morphometric data. 61. We estimate the age of our elk using their tooth wear. Two and a half. We're also collecting blood. 
It usually takes us about half an hour to process an adult female elk, after which time we give her a reversal drug, which counteracts the sedative that we initially gave her when she arrived at the processing site. And then we allow her to gradually wake up on her own and go off and rejoin the herd. And hopefully in a few months, we'll be able to follow up on her and capture her calf and learn a little bit more about this herd. As managers, we want to see high pregnancy rates and we would like to see fairly high recruitment each year so that you have an age distribution within the population that favors younger animals. There's resilience in that. The first place that our managers focus their concerns when it comes to human recreation impacts on elk is in the calving range area. We need to study each stage of production and survival. We're looking at calf survival to figure out how many calves are surviving through to the first year of life and then if they don't survive, what killed them. The vaginal implant transmitters have a light and temperature sensor. Every 20 minutes, the GPS collars that we put on our adult females checks the light reading and the temperature reading on that vit. If that temperature has dropped below 32 degrees Celsius, or if that vit has sensed light, then it will trigger that GPS collar to drop a location, as well as immediately send us a text and email. We relay that information to the capture team who go and locate that calf, put either a GPS collar on it or a VHF collar that communicates with the collar on the mother. One of the interesting things we've been seeing from the Avalanche Creek elk herd in the Roaring Fork Valley is that a number of our collared adult females give birth up in the Alpine and a number of those are also in wilderness. As someone who's had to follow the path of these elk to go up there and collar these calves at 12,000 feet, I can tell you it's a pretty amazing journey that they're undertaking. These animals will often be hanging out at around 8,000 feet and then migrate 10 to 15 kilometers, changing four to 5,000 feet in elevation, and then give birth at 12,000 feet within as little as six or seven hours after they left the valley floor. These alpine areas that these elk are migrating into to calve in provide nutritional advantages to these elk because you have this sort of prolonged snow melt, afternoon thunderstorms, and cooler weather, which allows vegetation up there to stay green long after the valley floors and foothills have turned brown. These alpine areas may have fewer predators as well, which may be an advantage. And then these wilderness areas also offer additional refuge from human disturbance, which may be important. We've been up here searching for the calf that was born yesterday around noon. We picked up the vit, which tells us when and where she gave birth. We're going to be expanding our search from here. There she is. There's a number of precautions we take when we capture those young cows. We make sure that we quietly approach that calf to disturb it as little as possible, and we wear latex gloves so we're not transferring any scent to those calves and are careful not to let them touch our body. We try and limit handling and processing time to five or 10 minutes. We collect a number of body measurements as well as the weight of the calf. Calf survival is correlated with weight, and it's also a metric of what sort of condition that adult female was in, so it's an important measurement to take. 1639. Ears wet, nope, they're dry. Still got some matted fur on it, bed in the back. Those have a quarter white, umbilical scab builder. We descent all of our collars. The calf collars we're using are expandable to accommodate the rapid growth of calves, and they're designed to stay on approximately one year. Can I get this? and then we just quietly leave the area. And most times, especially with those newborn calves, they don't even move at all from where we found them. And the nice thing about the GPS collars we have on the adult females is that we can see when they return to the calves. We're monitoring those calves daily from the day we capture them until one to one and a half years of age if the collar stays on that long, with the goal of estimating survival and to collect data on habitat selection calves are vulnerable, they're not as big, and so if they're getting moved around, that increases their relative vulnerability to predation if they're not using habitats that they feel the most secure. 
repeatedly being bumped or moved out of those areas is where you can see compounding effects. We haven't measured it yet, but if that is indeed the case, it's something that we could potentially mitigate with how we use our trails or where we build them. Some of our concerns with the traditional collaring approach to studying wildlife is that elk are very mobile animals and we know that we can go out and put a radio collar on some. And if we go out and target an animal that's in a specific study unit, there's no guarantee that that animal won't leave. Our concern is that if a radio collared animal did end up leaving and never came back, in reality, there might be another animal that backfills in behind it that doesn't wear a collar. And so there's actually no change in the number of animals using the landscape. It's just different individuals. So the second part of the research is using camera traps. We put out two cameras per square mile, and we have eight different study units. We have between 220 and 230 cameras deployed taking sequential photos. So we're gonna have literally hundreds of thousands of photos of nothing but the forest. In some instances, there are gonna be animals there. And, th and when we do have animals there, those are the shots that allow us to estimate abundance. We're putting cameras in grids in several key important study units. We have them set up to take sequential photographs every few minutes. This allows us to correlate back to the number of animals in that study unit. What we're really interested in with these grids is not so much relative abundance from one grid to another, because that's not necessarily all that meaningful. It's more what is happening within that grid over time. We're just interested in the total number of animals that are around. Some of these areas have a lot of trail use and trail development, and people are out there quite a bit. Others are on the opposite end of the spectrum, where there's no trails in there and there's really no plan to put trails in there. Then we have some study units also where proposed trails are going to be coming in. That's really where I think the creativity with land use planning impacts elk. If we do see changes in these, we can also start manipulating potentially our behavior of like, when do we open those trails up? Do we want to regulate or manage how they're being used? And I think that's where hopefully fairly small changes in our own behavior can lead to fairly meaningful mitigation of any negative impact to elk. Outdoor recreation is a way of life in Colorado and it's vital to our social well-being and it contributes immensely to our economy as well. Ultimately, it's a great thing that we have more and more people interested in outdoor recreation and our natural resources because I think with that interest comes passion and stewardship. We're going to have more people that care about elk populations in the state of Colorado. The robust elk populations we have today are a direct result of sound science-based management and conservation. And it's important that we keep studying these elk herds and learning about them so that we can ensure that they have a bright future. I feel incredibly lucky and privileged to get to research elk in Colorado. They're this really majestic animal and they're rewarding and challenging to study and they're important culturally to the people of Colorado. So I feel privileged to try and work to keep sustainable populations here in the state for generations to come.